Hi, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar this morning. Um, I'm Tammy Samuel. I am co-head of the Rail Practice and head of the International Finance Practice at Stevenson Harwood. And I have to say, in non-COVID times, we do lots of thought leadership sessions such as this and we accompany it with a lovely dinner and some lovely wine so i have promised the speakers that once we're allowed to i shall have them back in our offices and and they can come and break bread with all of us and and have a chat in in a, a little bit more civilized circumstances um we're really looking forward to your thoughts and input today so um both our speakers um, uh, are going are gonna to give us their insights and also we'll be looking forward to having any questions from you so today we're talking about decarbonisation of rail and it's obviously high on the agenda. The PM announced yesterday that we're all going to be driving electric cars in a few years time. But of course, rail also has its part to play in the decarbonisation of transport. We've got the move to nuclear power, net zero by 2050 with the railway looking to be net zero closer to 2040. Um, and what we'll hear today is some, about some of the technology that is available and being developed with the key question being, how do we move from the concepts to the implementation and of course, make it all commercially viable. Um, I'm gonna just have a couple of admin issues before we go over to our chairperson, Clive Roberts today. Um, the session is being recorded and we will make it available to all of you. Um, profiles of all of our speakers are available on our website um, if you want to have a look at that. Um, and following the session, we will also distill the debate into 10 key issues as we do with all of our thought leadership sessions, and we'll share that with you as well. If you do have any questions today, please pop them in the chat function and we'll answer as many as we can. Um, and we'll also be looking to pose some questions to you, so don't entirely go to sleep and look out for the polls that we pop up on the screen and, and, and answer those for us. Also have a look out for further thought leadership sessions that we're planning to run this year. So we're just starting this debate um, with plenty more debates to be had, um, including perhaps one around whether private investment can be used to, to make uh, decarbonisation a reality. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Clive. I should mention at the outset that uh, we've got Bill till about half past 10, so he's going to be going first. And we've got Clive till 11 on the dot when he has to jump off onto another session with the Rail Minister. So should we overrun now, I'll, I'll take over as chairperson just to finish off for the um, session. So I'll hand over to Clive. Uh, many of you will know Clive already and have probably been on other webinars before. Um, he is um, the head of the School of Engineering at the University of Birmingham and director at the Birmingham Centre for Railway Research and Education. And he's also lead for UK Rail Research, um, Railway Research and Innovation Network. He works extensively in the railway industry and academia in Britain and overseas. So thank you very much, Clive. Thank you, Tammy, um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm delighted to be here um, today to be able to um, chair the event. Um, as Tammy says, um, the focus today, we, we, we know that there's alternative technologies that are available that we can, we can use, but the focus today is really how do we move to those next steps of making them commercially and operationally viable, viable and, and get for those concepts that are you know, in early stages of the, the railway industry, readiness levels, um, into T TRLs um, in the UK, how do we make them so that they can roll out across um, the, the whole of the network where they're appropriate? So is that real systems thinking that we want to focus on today? Um, we're joined by an expert panel. Um, I'll introduce them as we go through um, their, um, at, at their individual um, speeches, and, and then we'll come together to a panel, panel session. So without further ado, let me um, introduce Bill Reeve. Bill is Director of Rail at Transport for Scotland. Bill's got a, a few minutes to tell us his thoughts in this area and particularly the work that's being done um, in Scotland uh, around this space. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can. Let's see, can you, can you now see um, a picture of that rather splendid bridge? Indeed. Fine. Well, look, um, I've got seven to ten minutes, which is not a lot to talk about a very big subject. Uh, you may have read or heard that in Scotland we spell decarbonise E-L-E-C-T-R-I-F-Y. Uh, and perhaps I can explain a little bit about why as we go through. Uh, uh, if only I could work out how to make the slide go down. Ah, oh, there we go. 
So, um, uh, in the Scottish Parliament, we have our annual programme for government, the First Minister's programme for government, uh, and uh, that's the equivalent of the Queen's Speech for Scotland. Um, uh, and you'll see uh, that in this year, uh, even in the midst of COVID, we are still thinking about, as a strategic priority, the issue of decarbonisation. Uh, and and uh, COVID does not distract us from that task. It requires us actually to think about the Scotland that we want to uh, to emerge and move toward, emerge from COVID and move towards. Uh, and actually, in some ways, there are some opportunities that, that help us refocus on delivering a fairer, greener and more prosperous Scotland. Um, and it was in that context that in at the end of July this year, the Scottish Government published its Rail Decarbonisation Action Plan. Even whilst we were up to our neck in dealing with COVID, uh, it was still an issue of priority for our ministers to publish that plan. Uh, and that commits us to decarbonise rail services in Scotland by 2035, which is a five years, I think, ahead of the, the UK government target, if I recall correctly. Um, but why? Uh, why would we want to decarbonise rail? Uh, when actually, if you look at the transport mix, only 1.2% of, uh, of emissions from transport come from uh, rail. Well, transport is 37% of Scotland's total greenhouse gas emissions. And um, within that, uh, and, and, and it's a sector that has stubbornly remained high when others like energy generation have transformed their, uh, their position. Um, uh, and as well as the issue of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions, we have the whole issue of uh, air quality, particularly in cities. Uh, and the reason that we want to focus on the 1.2% uh, sector, which is rail, uh, is because we need the total percentage of transport delivered uh, to move from the 40% car and 25% van and heavy goods vehicles onto more sustainable forms of transport. Uh, and, and within that mix, um, we can see options uh, that are realistic for uh, decarbonizing private vehicles, to a certain extent light vans, HGVs remain a huge challenge, um, but a sustainable future is not one where the congestion is provided by electric cars instead of diesel cars. So there's a bigger picture here. We cannot get to our legally committed targets in Scotland without uh, behavior change and modal shift. Uh, and this is the priority that's reflected in Scotland's national transport strategy. Uh, we, pu uh, we published uh, uh, the new version of that strategy this year. Um, uh, and you'll see that hierarchy uh, of the transport that we want to encourage. Uh, firstly, walking and wheeling, then cycling, then public transport. Uh, after that, shared uh, uh, transport and, and at the bottom of the list, private car. And we want to do that because if we get this right, it will help reduce inequalities. It will help us take climate action. It will actually drive inclusive economic growth. Uh, and it will most certainly improve our health and well-being. But we're not, and I think sometimes in rail world, we can live in our own little bubble. Uh, we need to understand that rail exists in a competitive environment for, uh, for the behaviours of passengers and freight customers, and for the allocation of scarce uh, capital and operating cost resource. Um, so we are uh, working to phase out new petrol and diesel cars by 2032. Uh, that's been our commitment for some while now. Uh, we are working actively to decarbonize aviation to the extent that we can. We have a number of very short haul flights that provide critical connectivity to some of our island and remote communities. And actually that's now become incredible to think in terms of electric aviation. Uh, and there's also more we can do to reduce the carbon emissions at airports. Um, we already have uh, zero emission zones in some of our cities and we are driving forward the deployment of zero emission vehicles. Until recently, Aberdeen had the world's largest fleet of hydrogen buses, I believe. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, but for rail, it's about decarbonising our passenger rail services, but also critically our freight services as well. We have, as I think you touched on, uh, Tammy, a lot of uh, decarbonization choices. So you'll see there 
uh, a right mix of trains from uh, the existing 40-year-old uh, diesels that we are running on our intercity services through a pilot battery train, um, an Austrian battery train, a German uh, fuel cell train, and of course, good old-fashioned wiring going on. What a plethora of choices. Um, uh, and, and the simple truth is that those technologies are at different stages of development. Electrification is a well-kent friend, and notwithstanding the debacle of some schemes in England, actually in Scotland, we've been able to make it work for us, and we see a route to lower cost electrification through a rolling program of electrification, which is hugely important. Batteries look to us to be a mature technology that's continuing to improve all the time. Fuel cells are the tantalizing uh, technology. They are uh, potentially, and I'm obliged to colleagues at Birmingham University, the first uh, fuel cell locomotive I've ever been pulled behind uh, was a Birmingham University locomotive at the IMECI Railway Challenge uh, some years ago. And, uh, and, I, and I learned a lot from that, so um, certainly piqued my interest. Uh, but I, 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 we, what we see is a, the need for a transition plan which involves the use of, for example, hybrid battery and uh, electric technology. Uh, we see the need to uh, continue to make the most of our diesel fleet while we are electrifying because uh, I'd far rather have, uh, have someone traveling on a diesel train than in an internal combustion car. And I'd certainly far rather have freight being moved by a diesel freight train than uh, a heavy goods vehicle. Uh, so we talk about the diesel dilemma, which is about how in the short run they have a contribution to make to decarbonization on the railway, but clearly not in the long run. Um, uh, and there's, there's, a, there's work to be done in terms of uh, improving the emission diesels in the interim. Um, but uh, uh, we have quite a lot of experience of electrification in Scotland, uh, in some other countries I could mention. Uh, we've had a commitment to a rolling program of electrification for some years now. And even in the last 10 years, you'll see a list there of the schemes that, that, that we have now delivered. And, Something like 75% of all passenger journeys in uh, Scotland are already delivered by electric train, and something like 45% of all freight journeys are delivered by electric train. That last figure is frustratingly low, and the reason for that is though the bulk of the freight terminals in Scotland are electrically connected, England, there remain some frustratingly short connections not made to key freight locations like the Port of Fleetstone, uh, which uh, need to be converted so that we can get the advantages of electric traction, um, which will unlock capacity on some of our trunk routes, as well as reducing the cost of operation and the emissions. Um, so what are our challenges to make all this work? There's a lot more to do to drive down the cost of electrification uh, and indeed the disruption that current approaches to electrification entail. Um, uh, uh, and there is a need for greater efficiency uh, in the design, development and delivery of those schemes. Um, but frankly, this is a case of learning by doing. You can talk about it forever. The way we drive down the cost of our insulation and reduce the disruption uh, is through the, 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 the well-recognized phenomenon of the learning curve. And no surprises, our most recent electrification was delivered more cheaply with less disruption than some of our earlier ones. So we are going to carry on. We will continue uh, to reduce emissions from diesel during the transition period. We will think carefully about how we deploy those diesels uh, and we will procure new rolling stock, um, uh, including inevitably some uh, battery electric uh, as well as some good old-fashioned electrics along the way. And they will help us get more out of the electrification we already have. Um, but they are really, uh, I think, a transition rather than an end state. If you read our de Rail Decarbonisation Action Plan, this is what it, uh, you will find. Uh, on the left there, you see our current electric network. On the right, you will see that we are committed to electrifying all of the remaining routes in the central belt. There's not much left to do. Uh, our trunk routes to Aberdeen and to Inverness. We see some role for battery electric uh, between Aberdeen and Inverness and north to Dingwall. And for our 
our uh, most beautiful routes, the, uh, the world famous scenic railways of Scotland, the traffic density for the time being at least wouldn't justify electrification. And I think that's where on current prognosis, we would expect to be deploying fuel cell trains uh, by 2035. Um, all of this is about developing a sustainable railway business. Railways cost too much. So as well as reducing the emissions from transport, we need to reduce the net cost of transport to the exchequer and indeed to the freight customer. Um, on the left there, you can see uh, our newest station, no, actually our second newest station in Scotland, uh, Rob Royston, uh, which was opened about this time last year. Uh, uh, that's allowing communities to, to, a new community being built around that station to commute in a sustainable manner on a new electric train, fully accessible station, which is an important bit about a sustainable railway. Um, but the point about, about that is we drove down the cost of that station through innovation. We drove down the cost of the delivery of the service through electrification, and that provides a much more sustainable option. Um, quick assessment, first fag packet work, we've been looking at the choice between say an all hydrogen fuel cell railway for our remaining network versus a uh, trunk route electrification strategy. Just on operating costs of Scott Rail trains alone, we see the difference between those two options as about 50 million per annum. Um, and that's uh, that's not allowing for the fact that uh, and that's just the operating cost, not even the rolling stock ownership cost, which again would favour the simpler choice of electrification. So big capital costs for electrification, but real operating cost advantages, real revenue advantages, and real um, uh, uh, capacity advantages because I just draw your attention to that rather lovely field of cabbages on the bottom right of this picture. Above the cabbages, you will see a freight train. That's a new service just introduced uh, and freight is booming on the railway at the moment, notwithstanding COVID. Um, uh, but it's a train that's traveled a long way over an electric railway, pulled by a diesel train for want of a few miles of electrification. If it were being pulled by an electric train, firstly, it would go faster. Secondly, there would be more capacity on the East Coast Main Line to allow that train to run. And thirdly, the unit, uh, unit cost per container move would be substantially lower. That's a business winning proposition, and that's where we want to take our railway. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. And thank you um, for that context um, across Scotland that, that pulling out um, the choices we have for decarbonisation, which I'm sure will come up in the discussion and the trade offs between them, and really how you think about that as a planning for, for a nation, which is. Um, you know, moves us beyond just looking at the individual technologies, but actually how we roll this out as a, a system. We're, we're now going to move over um, to hear from Mike Muldoon, who's the head of um, business development for UK and Ireland at Alstom. Um, although he's head of development for UK and Ireland at Alstom, I'm sure we're going to hear quite a lot about Germany now, and um, um, which is where Alstom have been deploying um, particularly um, hydrogen traction. So I'm going to pull the hand over to Mike. Thanks very much, Clive. Um, I'm hoping that um, Sarah, who you, the rest of you can't see, can um, pop my slides up on the screen, please. So yeah, I'm head of business development um, at our store in the UK and Ireland, as Clive rightly pointed out, um, and. In that role, what I'm looking at particularly is, is where do we need to go in the future as Alstom, as a rail system supplier. Now, Bill's given you a fantastic introduction there to the way a national railway can look at its portfolio of solutions and how it's going to go forward. We as an OEM need to find ways to serve that. And in fact, Alstom is, is fairly unique in the market at the moment in that we can offer hydrogen multiple units, battery electric multiple units, electric multiple units, and electrification. Um, so we have quite a good decarbonisation portfolio already in place. But today I've been asked particularly to focus on what we're doing with hydrogen. Um, so whilst I'll talk about hydrogen, please don't think we're proposing this as the solution to everything. And I think Bill just has illustrated the point. If you look at an entire railway and say, am I going to electrify it or am I going to make it hydrogen? Um, electrification has some very strong arguments in its favour. However, if you break down the railway and you look route by route, 
as the decarbonisation action plan has done, you ultimately conclude you need a mix of technologies and we as a supplier need to provide that mix. Next slide, please. So what is the case for hydrogen trains? Why, why, why does hydrogen keep cropping up? And it's, it's not because we went away and developed one randomly or we thought it was just whimsically an engineering idea. It's because as we've looked at the problem of how to transport our energy with us, and as we've all collectively decided that diesel is no longer the way to do that because of the uh, health and uh, environmental downsides of using diesel, we've had to look at alternatives. And with current known technologies, there are two ways you can carry your energy with you um, and use it in an environmentally sustainable manner. And those are either batteries or hydrogen. Um, and neither of those solutions offer you the flexibility and the ultimate uh, opportunity that diesel provides because they have a lower energy density. And energy density is a, is a phrase that um, you may hear a lot in this kind of debate. What it boils down to is how far can you go with the energy you can carry? Um, and, and Clive will be shuddering at that non-technical description, um, but, but uh, for me, uh, uh, not as an engineer, but as someone working on how we deploy all these systems, what, what you're looking at is, is how do you replace that versatility of diesel in routes where electrification can't reach. And the conclusion of the, uh, of the uh, Rail and 3 Decarbonisation Task Force set up to respond to the 2040 Decarbonisation Challenge was that you mix electrification, battery and hydrogen technologies. That was backed up by the Traction Decarbonisation Network Strategy by Network Rail, at least in the interim business case. Um, and indeed in the, in the Transport Scotland Rail Services Decarbonisation Decarbonization Action Plan. So all of those committees and all of those review groups of very well informed experts in the industry have concluded that you need to mix the technologies. So there is a case for hydrogen. It's not for everywhere and it's not for everything. What does it do? Can I have the next slide please? So currently, um, the Karadia Island is the world's only in-service hydrogen uh, multiple unit. It's a hydrogen hybrid, it uses um, hybrid drive, so it has a fuel cell and a battery, which allows you to capture regenerative energy and reuse it. Um, so it's very energy efficient train, and that allows it to operate up to about a thousand kilometers, call it 600, 650 miles, um, at speeds of up to 100 miles an hour, 160 kilometers an hour. So it fits really well in the regional passenger service category at the current time. And I say at the current time because, um, uh, as, as Bill pointed out, these technologies are different stages of maturity uh, and the, the fuel cell has seen the least development compared to battery or electrification in recent times, so we're still building on those capabilities. The reason we use hydrogen in a fuel cell is that it creates no toxic emissions and emits no carbon. And as long as your hydrogen is produced in a carbon sensitive manner, you can be, uh, reach the point of absolute zero emission transport. Uh, so if you have green hydrogen as it's known, you, know, you can have a zero emission from well to wheel solution. And in fact, at the moment, that would make the train cleaner than an electrified train, because of course the grid isn't yet zero emission. Um, the performance is targeted to replace the diesels that are currently operating those same services, of course, Hydrogen trains are electric trains, so there are benefits, certainly in, in ride, passenger safety, uh, passenger comfort, and uh, in terms of um, uh, acceleration rates and other things, you can, you can operate the train as, a, as an electric train. So that is much, uh, a much nicer proposition for passengers in the stations as they inhale and on the train as they travel. Um, you can also introduce a hydrogen train, of course, without the inevitable um, service interruption that the electrification can generate um, to some degree or other. So what that means in Germany now, two trains have operated for over uh, for just under two years, 180,000 kilometers. They've then moved to the Netherlands and on now into passenger service in Austria. 41 trains are ordered in Germany and will enter service in the next uh, two years. Next slide, please. So the long and the short of it is that, is that when you look at this technology, we shouldn't keep comparing back to diesel. Bill has pointed out that we need economic sustainability as well as uh, environmental sustainability, if you like. Uh, we need to make these systems cost effective. 
that applies as much to electrification as it does to hydrogen, as it does to battery. We know that all of them can become very costly. Um, but in reality, the technologies we are talking here, the competition or the, the evaluation is not referring back to what diesel could do, because diesel kills people, whether we like it or not. The comparison now is where, where should we electrify, where should we use hydrogen, and where might we use batteries. And hydrogen really fits the longer, trickier regional routes, those lines in green that you just saw on Bill's map. Next slide, please. So what Alstom is doing in the UK is working with Eversholt Rail um, to convert class 321 trains. These are going to be known as the class 600 Breeze trains um, and we anticipate them becoming the first operational hydrogen fleets in the country. Um, we've invested quite a lot of money in their development thus far and, and what that development constitutes is adapting what we've learned as Alstom in Germany and in Europe operating what are larger trains and adapting that technology and applying it to the smaller UK rail gauge. And that means some issues around how do you package the um, equipment on board the train, how do you make it fit? Um, and that is quite a, a potential constraint. So a lot of work needs to go into that and that's what we've been doing as we prepare for the, the, uh, the green light to deploy the first fleet. Next slide, please. And of course, at the moment, there is a chance to really build on this. I know that in, in Scotland, there are projects afoot to uh, develop the hydrogen fuel cell and hydrogen technology supply chain. We see the same opportunities across the UK with deployments of fleets, activation, uh, creating a demand for this type of technology. There is the scope for the UK to become a global leader in, in the production, export and, and, and creation of this type of technology. We can really have make inroads globally as long as we have a domestic demand to actually get on and do this so we believe that um you know there is that huge opportunity for the country which unfortunately we don't have with batteries because um we're not at the forefront of that no matter what we do now we will be following but in hydrogen there is still that opportunity to become a, a world leader uh, in elements of the technology uh, that are required on trains on buses on heavy goods vehicles um, but rail has a real chance to help jumpstart that process um, with our, our well-managed fleet uh, deployments, working on timetables with guaranteed demand. So, and I think that really sums up a very quick run through what, what the issues are around hydrogen. But like I say, don't be fooled that there is no one size fits all solution to decarbonizing the railways. We're going to need all of these things and we must make sure we develop them all in parallel and we deploy them all in parallel and do that crucial learning that they'll talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, that's superb and it's, it's great to hear um, all about the, the you know, the, the actual operation um, of iLint um, in Germany and, and the potential to be able to bring that to the to the UK market. Um, we've got Bill for a, a few more minutes, and I think it is only a few minutes. Um, so um, I'm I, I'm keen that we 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 ask him some questions while we've got him. And um, there's a there's a couple on the chat. So perhaps if I can I can start off um, with a couple of those that I think um, are, are more focused um, for Bill. And if others have um, questions they want to ask, then throw them in the chat, and I'll I'll pick them out as as a, appropriate. Um, there's there's one here, Bill from from Nigel Murphy. Um, asking about how do we um, think the challenges necessary for, for decarb um, actually provides an opportunity to do all sorts of things in the railway industry better. Um, I thought that might be a good question for you. What, what are your thoughts on this? I'm sure you have thoughts on this. I, it's, do you know what? It's, it's, uh, it, it, it's really a, a guiding light. We've got a clear target. Uh, that our ministers are committed to and ju just you know I think it's quite an important difference here um, the the network rail traction decarbonization network statement or forgive me if I got the title wrong is a recommendation to the UK government uh, the Scottish rail decarbonization action plan is an instruction from the uh, from the Scottish government to the rail industry in Scotland um, and and actually that focuses uh team scotland's mind on what we have to achieve uh and sometimes we are we are faced with a uh plethora of choices um spoilt for 
choice of what we could and should invest in in public transport generally rail in particular um, this gives us our guiding light and it's focusing our minds uh, very nicely um, uh, and it and it's re re it requires us actually to put aside some things we might otherwise have done and focus on this target but we are getting a clear vision of how that takes us to a better more financially sustainable more attractive more efficient railway um, it's actually quite exciting Yes, indeed, I, I agree. And I, I think, um, you know, we have a, a real potential as an industry here to, to have some really good news stories and 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 to be able to to fit this into the system context so that you know, we, you, get, we, get, we get bigger bank, grab bank. Just, just one other thing. Um, it's also for us, and this is hugely important, particularly post-COVID, it's a chance to generate secure, good quality employment in Scotland. So infrastructure projects have a, a lot of value. Uh, railway employment is good quality employment um, uh, and a, a prospect that allows Scottish Government to spend money once on um, uh, on decarbonisation but that works twice for us because it in turn is used to create employment and to procure services and materials from within Scotland is a very intelligent use of our scarce resource so uh, but that does require us to have uh, the confidence that we can convey that there will be a steady workload to cause our suppliers to invest in resources, training, development, teams, equipment in Scotland for this programme. So it's a it, it is a real real prize in that sense as well. Indeed, and we, we, we've obviously one been one last on question. I'm sorry, Clive, for, 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 for that, for that, for that, but, but, but there is an international market. Oh, okay, right. Um, um, thank you, Bill. Thank you so much. Um, so um, let's move on with some of the other questions as Bill Bill disappears. Um, we've got some questions here um, about um, Island that um, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up um, with with Mike. And then we'll form the panel once we've picked up some of these very specific questions. So there's a question here, Mike, um, from, from somebody anonymous um, that is, um, is the Caradia Island technology scalable to fit the UK gauge? You've, you've talked a bit about in, this in your, your presentation, um, but, but um, the question really is, is, does that impact the range or the performance or, or the, the, the capacity of the vehicle from a passenger perspective um, while, while those changes are made? So uh, the downside, the energy density of hydrogen, even compressed at 350 bar, which is what, what we use, uh, which is a sort of commercial vehicle general standard around the world at the moment, means that you need eight times the space to fit the hydrogen into the tray, into the fuel tanks, compared to diesel. So it's one eighth of the energy density of diesel that means is you do need a lot more space to package the equipment um, and that is then a an issue with um, what do you do in terms of um, uh, fitting all the equipment the range and the performance of the train can't be impacted the train won't serve its purpose if um, it can't, hasn't got the range and it can't do that distance uh, and, and it can't operate at the relevant speeds. It has to meet the timetable. So that the, you can't just compromise on that and, and create a train that's too slow and, and um, uh, not operational. So you have to find ways to make it work. And the way to make it work is to um, is to look at the overall packaging of the train. And what we've done for the UK is actually uh, the target trains for replacement typically let's call them one five X's or whatever two car uh, diesel trains. Um, would typically be about 46 metres long. Um, a breeze train is actually 60 metres long. Um, the additional space is not additional passenger capacity. It is to, to a large extent used for fuel and equipment. What that gives us though is a train of marginally more passenger space, all mod cons, more doors, more access routes, better air conditioning and all uh, that matches the current trains. And also despite the slight increase in the length of the train it's still viable on the routes that um, are served by those dmus so you know you, you do have to make some compromises but it's it's feasible and plausible to replace the trains and provide passengers with a better service 
Yes, excellent. And I think I think that's um, the, the sort of experience of our thinking around this as well is, 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 is very much, very much the same. What, what I'd like to do is now bring in um, a, a, another member of, of, of our panel. Um, so um, we have Ian Ray um, on the line. He's Operational Development Director at Atkins. Um, do you want to just say a few words to introduce yourself, Ian? Yes, uh, uh, good morning all. Um, Ian Ray, uh, Operations Development Director for Atkins Rail, a uh, rail consultancy business in Scotland. Uh, I have the pleasure of being the chair of the rail division I'm a key in Scotland, which, which, which has a great benefit in terms of we've had a number of presentations uh, going through our, our centre in terms of on decarbonisation. I think what's been really good is that we've had presentations on that for the last maybe three, four years, paving the way. So I think, as, as Bill says, it's sort of helped us sort of prepare in terms of what's happening next. I think there has been a clear vision uh, from Scotland's Railway of what they need. There's very much been an agenda piece. So it's, uh, <clears throat> it's been, a real, been a real nice position to be in, uh, in terms of, right, I, 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 in Scotland, where we do have a clear, clear, uh, focus of this 2035 uh, and a clear vision that we need folks on electrification or we need battery trains and we need uh, hydrogen trains as well. So we're actually in a very good position in terms of clear direction. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a massive amount of challenges uh, in this. I uh, think Bill talked about it's got to be cost effective. Uh, it's one of the things that's got to be cost effective, it's got to be appealing. I uh, know it's one of the questions coming in is how do we get people from the from cars onto rail, whether or not it's freight or whether or not it's passengers, it, it's got to be appealing. We've got we've got to run services at the right time. Uh, it's got to be reliable. It's got to be cost effective from their point of view. So it's a lot, a lot of challenges of decarbonisation, but making sure we appeal to both our, our passengers and to our freight customers as well. Excellent. Thank you. I, I, you're, you're, you're most certain, certainly right. Um, now, we're going to try and um, push the bounds of our technical ability here. We've got some polls um, for you to interact with. Um, and I just want to launch the first one of those. We'll start you off with, with an, a, not, a, a fairly nice and easy question around technology choices. So um, Sarah's just launched the poll. Thank you, Sarah. Perfect timing. So um, the first poll, um, and then we'll pick up some discussions around this. You've, you've obviously heard um, from from Bill and and Mike around um, the the different decarbonisation options that they they've been thinking about and that mix. Um, so what's the most important to develop um, going forward? So what do we need to really develop and um, focus on development for decarbonisation for traction energy and rail? So you've got a selection of choices there. Um, hopefully you can that's come up on your screen and you can start 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 sort of um, um, responding to that. But while while that's that's happening. Um, I guess um, Mike and, and and Ian, what what are your sort of personal views on on this in terms of the the, the space that we really need to put the development effort? Mike, um, I think I just said really we we need to develop them all, um, yep. but the type of development is probably different per area. Mm -hmm. So there is scope for greater technical. Uh, development still in hydrogen and, and in battery and probably there is an electrification. In electrification sure. the pro focus is on how to do it, how to do it cost effectively and as, as with an absolute minimum disruption to service, how to make efficient that timing so if you're fitting electrification and you're only doing it when the trains aren't running you've got a very small window to get in there and do it so some of our mitigations to keep operations running drive up the cost and complexity of delivering electrification. How do you compromise? How do you make that work? And also we've got things like the electrification of wiring train, which is a product specifically developed and used in Scotland to, to put up wires more quickly and to try and reduce the number of people and, and bits of equipment that you have to put onto the line each night as you go uh, moving forward. I think there's, like I said, every, each area needs to develop, but there are gonna be different focuses within them. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think in terms of, um, Ian, perhaps um, you, you can perhaps follow up a little bit more about that, that operational and, and I guess business case and financial sort of development um, beyond the, the, the technology. Um, or you, the results are just coming up. It's in, interesting there. You can, you can all see 
the, all of the above. So I, I think the, the, the messaging from, from Bill in particular um, um, resounds through there and, and, and shared. Um, but, but Ian, um, can you talk a little bit about the sort of operational financial modeling, you know, um, where that, that, that development needs to focus? The more knotty questions perhaps than, than the pure technology development. Yeah, in terms of financial, when Bill talked about it and Mike's talked about it, it's about that sort of cost effective. Of it. I think there's two parts of that. One about is part of it, we've just got to do some of it. We've got to learn from it uh, using, I suppose, the, the lessons that Bill came in terms of legislation in Scotland. The first one we did in Edinburgh Glasgow, yeah, that was over budget. Uh, then we moved into Sunderland in Alloa, got better, we've done shots. So it's that continual learning bit. So, Part of the cost effective is about, next possibly we've got to crack on and do some of this. It's the best way of learning. I think there's other bits in terms of bringing costs out, is like the technology side of it. it obviously, battery technology is moving on, but even the electrification side, one of the biggest costs for electrification isn't putting up the wires. That may be a third, 40% of the cost. A bigger the cost is raising all the bridges, all the all this kind of preliminary work that in a way it doesn't add value. It doesn't put like it's how you reduce the clearances and all that. So it's about pushing the standards, using the innovation to bring that cost down. And if you can if we don't bring the cost down, we don't have a cost effective railway. If we don't have a cost effective railway, we don't have people using it. We don't have freight using it. So it's one of the things that say uh, to get passengers on, my belief it's got to be cost effective. Uh, and, and I suppose yeah, Part of that, it's almost in terms of the, the key stakeholders in terms of the governments and the uh, Rail and Travel Scotland is having the faith of well, let's crack on and do it and learn. And part of it, the industry in terms of suppliers have got to come with innovations to reduce that cost and, and make it a viable railway. Um, excellent. And, and, and I, I guess the, the sort of follow on to question to that, which I, I guess Mike might be able to, to pick up from an operational experience in, in Germany, but, but e e equally in is is we obviously have people in the room in terms of the, the, the suppliers, um, the railways, who else do we need in this discussion to actually make this a success? Where, where are the stakeholders that in the, I guess purely in the UK context, um, I'm, I'm thinking that, that we need to be engaging with in the next stage of this to really get the momentum that we're, we're really hoping for? Well, we've got two paths here. Um, when you talk about electrification, it's in the hands of the infrastructure owner um, and the uh, and largely out of the hands of the operator we know the tensions that can create but that's a different story when we talk about traction technology on train technology you're in the realms of of the operator you're in the realms of the safety case that the operator owns and, and has to uh, has to support and so i think it's it's absolutely key to have operators uh, closely involved in all of this and that's obviously quite difficult at the moment given the state of rail operations in the UK at the moment and uh, through no real fault of any of the actual operators themselves we, we find ourselves in the crisis of other making um, and we also have the reorganization around um, arising from the pandemic situation and also um, potentially linked to the Williams review output as and when that comes clear so I think um, it's a little bit tricky at the moment, but, but operators will be key to this um, and their preferences may start to emerge as well. Um, we're unlikely to see franchises uh, configured in the way they were in the past, but operators still have a big, should have a big influence in what technology they want to operate and what they think they can achieve most cost effectively and attractively to passengers. Because I think one, one key area here is we heard yesterday that um, you and I are no longer going to be allowed to buy cars south of the border at least after 2030 with which is pure petrol or diesel it's hard to imagine um, a railway perhaps the one envisaged in the tdns in particular where where we're still electrifying into the 2060s and therefore we're running potentially diesel bimodes or diesel trains into that period how do we attract modal shift um, mm -hmm. when people aren't allowed to travel by diesel on the road but are allowed to travel it on, on rail. And I know there's all the arguments about how much the, the emissions are per person are very low. It's just that fundamental point. So I think there's yeah. a lot of public perception and the public have also really carried with us on all of this. Yeah, and I think um, over the next year, the public perception will change quite significantly um, compared with where, what we, we um, 
um, I think today, you know, my, my, my children will have quite different views to, to what we have um, as they grow up as, as to what we have today. This is quite a good slot to bring in the next poll if we, a poll if we can, um, Sarah. So um, that's going to focus on really, we've, we've just talked about some of the stakeholders that, that, that need to engage. And I'm going to give Ian to sort of an opportunity to follow up on that a little bit more in a moment. But, but this is really who should be in the lead, who should be, so that the, the question in the poll is, um, which, which entities should be taking the lead in relation to decarbonisation of rail? And while people are feeling that in, um, can you perhaps um, elaborate a little bit more, Ian, on, on some of those other people we need to have in the room for, to, to make this a success and to, to keep us moving um, uh, um, um, at speed? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think the first of all, that's coming through in the poll uh, is, is, making, is, is the government to family. They, they are the prime funder uh, of the rail, we just now, uh, even more so than they were before. And they were, they were a significant funder before for a number of the franchises, uh, and therefore very much a funder in the future. So uh, they, they've got to be a key part of this. And uh, to a certain extent, I mean, it's great that Boris announced yesterday that uh, as of uh, 2030, you can't buy a diesel electric car. Uh, now, from a government point of view, they can make a statement like that, and the market has to follow and make it happen, type thing. Uh, it's not quite so easy, because uh, if he said that for real, uh, nice boss, he's got to pay for that. Uh, I think part, part of that, so the government has got to be key. There is an element, what we need to do as an industry, and this is where the operators kick in, is we've got to sort of justify it in terms of, right, why, why should the government uh, put billions into this railway to electrify it, to to, to allow uh, hydrogen trains to do the necessary infrastructure for hydrogen trains and batteries. So there's a lot of money here, and uh, obviously the, the, the decarbonisation strategy paper outlined what we'd like and what we want to hit the decarbonisation targets. But we've got to have that compelling argument to the government in case of this adds value. I, and I think, I think what and I think less than that from the Scottish government, they don't think of the railway as a business by itself. Uh, probably maybe a good example, Airdrie Bathgate line, a line that recently opened, probably from a P&L point of view on that individual line, it doesn't make money. But the economic benefit that brings of connecting people, getting sort of, I say, areas that are maybe struggling financially, impoverished, whatever, and bringing them up, there's a bigger economic benefit and I think that's that's a bit if we just go to the government we want lots of money to do lots of electrification and decarbonisation you're in a fight here there's a lot of people wanting money NHS is crying out for money we've got to add we've got to show we can demonstrate the value so yes government's key but we need the key stakeholders to train operators saying right if you give us the money this is the overall economic benefit we can give you so yeah uh, get, getting your pound of money off the government is going to be tough but you've got to have a compelling argument for that. And I suppose that's when network rail uh, train operators, the freight companies, the supply chain, they've got to have that clear message. We can add value. The money you give us, we can multiply that really well. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Ian. And we, we're just seeing the results on, on, on the poll. And, and um, there's a strong um, sort of focus here on, on the DFT. But I, I, I think I would argue that the, the broader argument here is, is, is around... Um, the, the whole economy um, about a bill mentioned about creating jobs um, about looking at the energy sector um, supporting um, broader general um, direction so for example in in the UK um, in, in, in Birmingham um, we're working in the um, Birmingham energy hub um, area where there's a, a clean air zone for technology and there'll be some hydrogen production there but the, the plan is to use it for for taxis and buses and potentially rail going forward and, and really talking to some of those other transport modes, other hydrogen, in that case, hydrogen users, and actually working together. I, my, my feeling is that in order to get costs down, get some of the, there's, there's all, uh, 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 and technology to the play, place of maturity that is in the right place, we, we need to be much working, much more beyond the rail sector to make some of this, 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 this happen. Um, is, think, is that I your think... experience, Mike, as well, I think? Yeah, I, I would totally agree. Um, one of the things we found in discussing hydrogen trains is just how interdependent we are in the energy mm -hmm. sector. Yeah, um, That immediately brings in BASE, the Department yeah. of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, on top of DFT. Um, and I think, obviously, the key, uh, the purse strings are held by the Treasury, mm -hmm. um, which is, is the, if you like, the deciding factor in government. And I, and I think 
one key area in this is is how those business cases are evaluated the ones that, that, that Ian was just talking about we've seen some um, references recently to D the Treasury changing how it evaluates some project uh, assessments um, but the real change needs to come around how do we value in the benefit of decarbonizing what's the what's the true value of saving carbon um, and I don't think that's yet fully worked through in terms of um, what are we mitigating here why are we doing all of this um, there's clean air benefits with diesel which are lovely to have of course and, and clean air is the stuff that kills us today carbon kills us tomorrow we're told but if it's if but i think there's a good consensus we agree with that so what are we going to do about it how you know this is what the government's investing in it's not strictly investing in the rail industry it's investing in a means of moving people around the country in a way that doesn't expose us to a huge climate risk in 30 40 years time so you've got to link all those factors so i think it very much is a, a, a top level issue above and beyond what the dft can construct for itself for example yeah i, I so i we, I, I agree and we, we, we've we've got about 10 minutes left and i i think there's two points i'd like to, to bring up so if we if we can pull on to the next poll um sarah that's really um talking about what sort of interventions might be needed specifically for for hydrogen um, so really is hydrogen technology without further intervention commercially viable and that's really thinking about um, government intervention intervention from other other stakeholders though those sorts of things so we, 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 we'll, we'll leave that up and as we we have that perhaps we can start to think a little bit about um, the sort of energy markets a little bit more and 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 how we might buy sell use energy in the future um, you know, are, are we are we perhaps thinking of of um, energy energy by the by the kilometer type bit of views, or, or have we got some different ways of thinking about the markets? Um, Ian, Mike, who, who's who's the best to pick this up? Just a thought here, and that's how we drive right behaviour here. Yeah, and, and yeah, just absolutely. Yeah, people are hopping in hydrogen trains, hydrogen cars, and battery cars, and all that. But ultimately, one of the things we've got to think about is in the future, the government get a lot of money from taxing diesel, etc. Uh, massive amount of money. That's got to be replaced by something. And I'm interested in how, how, they, how they tax might influence what we do. Uh, if, 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 hydrogen, if, if hydrogen on passenger, passenger vehicles is taxed high, does that drive people to, towards trains that, that effectively use either hydrogen better or electricity better. Uh, so there's a little bit of, you mentioned about how, how, how it's costing, there's got to be a tax implication somewhere along this. If we get taxed by the mail just now when we're in a car, you, that, that revenue has got to be filled by the government one way or another. It could be, are we, are we going to be taxed by, by the mail uh, on electric cars or by the train and all that? And I think that's where train then starts kicking in again. Yeah, you can have an electric car that takes the carbon box, or you can go on a train, where it could be decarbonised, electric, hydrogen, battery. But the train is always should always be more effective than that, I could say, because it cost or price per mile type thing. And that's the bit where like, we've really got to sort of push ourselves. Because uh, ultimately, someone say, I can drive my green car, or I can go on a train. Both, both are potentially green. But we've really got to sell that train is much more greener. Than, than than the car, and I think I think Clive, you mentioned about our kids grow up in a different different way, and uh, they are much more environmentally focused. Uh, and if if we can present that rail is a much more greener option to our customers, that's an appeal, and we should really market that. Uh, and maybe the government needs to tax the, the counter to that as well, the less green options. Excellent. And I, I, Tammy, this is very much in, in your space, I believe, as well. Uh, can we can we bring you in a bit in terms of, of, of this and how how how, how things um, um, work in this area? Yeah, I mean, I think there was a question in the chat as well from Marco about whether whether we can get um, private finance in, in, in essence to help with the decarbonisation of railway and what and what's required to do that. Um, I, I think unfortunately it comes back to one of the original questions um, that, that we had and that we've been debating and that is having that kind of clear direction from the top. Um, and therefore, then, then kind of think technologies will generally become more commercially viable the more that they're used. And again, a, a question 
uh, from S Evans. You know, the DFT doesn't have all the answers. Bill made an important point about the Scottish government giving a clear target, which ministers are committed to, not waiting to be told the choices. So it's a little bit chicken and egg in a sense. You know, can you go out there and make something commercially viable without having that kind of top level, the top level coverage and the um, and, and the clear kind of targets that you want to get to? And just uh, just in terms of how that might work with the future kind of train operating um, concessions that are coming in, um, there will clearly need to be within there either specific um, kind of obligations on the train operators to do something or really, really clear incentives for them to do so. I think then um, what I would hope wouldn't happen in the um, in the, in the new concession is that you take away some of the innovation that some of the train operators have driven over the years because they have driven um, technology forward and they have driven innovation uh, going forward and and uh, I really hope that we can keep that because I think that will all help in terms of giving the guidance at the top giving the direction through the concession agreements um, and then finally kind of driving technologies um, through to commercial viability. Yeah, and my, my feeling is this is really very much the the untapped thought process of of where we are with this. We 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 haven't got this um, sort of laid out, and um, perhaps the the the, the development in, in in thought process or consistent thought process in 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 this area as, as much as perhaps we should have to move things forward. And I, I think as well, kind of just say you know it does need it does all of these things will need intervention. We've seen the results on the other question there. Um, we only have seat belts in cars because they were legislated in there. Mm. We only have unleaded fuel in cars because we legislated leaded fuel away. The only reason the automotive sector is pressing into hybrids and full electric vehicles is due to legislation. Mm. Um, that's where the DAP and the TDNS, as Bill pointed out, vary. If, if Scotland is instructing its rail industry to do something, in, Brit in the rest of the UK, we've got um, the TDNS being a recommendation, arguably from a part of government to another part of government, but whatever. Um, it, 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 perhaps it's weaker, but I, you need clear requirements so that OEMs like Alstom will develop a product to meet those requirements. Because at the end of the day, you know, if the automotive sector, as we see in America, could still be selling massive uh, gas guzzling, um, inefficient vehicles, and the people are still buying them, then nothing changes. Why would it? That, that's not how the market will drive itself. The market, you know, government's job is to set parameters that the rest of us don't have to deliver on. Excellent. Now, what I want to do is to bring things to a close here. I think um, over the last hour, we've started from understanding very much, um, you know, bills as a, as a representative nation, um, aspiration um, for going forward in terms of decarbonisation. Move through with Mike, um, you know, confidence and realisation that, 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 that that's possible, um, particularly in hydrogen, but in, in, in the other areas that we've been talking about. And then I think the panel discussion has really sort of brought out um, the, the broader thinking of where this all sits in terms of context of, of incentivisation, um, how we actually use the markets to bring this forward, um, get it, you know, actually getting to the point and I, I very much believe that's the next big hurdle. Um, the, the technology um, I think is proven but we need to look at how we can reduce costs and make sure that we can support it operationally but, but really actually that wide-scale rollout um, needs much more thought and, and that broader stakeholder engagement both in terms of how that sits in, in just the context of the industry but actually how we sit with the uh, energy sector, the broader transport, how we make a case for, for job creation, all of those things need to come into this pot to move things forward. So can I thank our panel? Um, um, Bill, um, who, who obviously had to leave, um, Mike, um, Ian, and, and Tammy, sorry for, 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 for putting you on the spot and pulling you in, but I, I know this is an area you know an awful lot about, so I felt we, we, we should bring you in as well. Um, Thank you very, very much for um, all your views. Um, I see a couple of comments in the chat saying um, it's been a good session and it's something that we should follow up on. I, I think I, I would agree with that. I think it's, it's, a, it's a nice area to sort of pick up at a fairly regular interval just to see how things are moving because things are very moving very rapidly in this space. So thank you very much, everyone online. Um, a good number of you have, 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 have more as all of you have, 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 have stayed for the full hour. I know that's difficult in our busy schedule. So thank you very much and hopefully speak to you again soon.
Thank you. Yeah, Thank thanks, you. thanks, Clive. As you rush off to see the minister, just to just to reiterate, we will follow up with the recording of um, of this session and also 10, 10 key um, issues arising out of it. So goodbye, everybody. Uh, thank you to our panelists. Um, thank you to Atkins once again for supporting us um, in our thought leadership. And uh, we'll we'll see you all at the next session. Look out for that. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone.